love is in the air. Jack and I had been seeing each other for a little over three months when we attended a performance of the new musical, Tales of the City, at ACT. We were in the infant stages of our relationship, that special period of time when both parties are totally smitten and still view one another as perfect in every possible way, have yet to get into a single argument, and could swear that they've never felt this way about anyone else before in their whole entire lives. <laughs> but simply, it was love, pure and true. All the orchestra level seats, as well as all of those in the mezzanine, were completely sold out that evening. So we had to settle for the balcony. How lowly, I said, <laughs> half jokingly after the pimply faced usher had shown us to our seats. I can't believe we're sitting in the balcony. Don't be a snob, Jacques replied. There's nothing wrong with sitting in the balcony. They pee on the seats in the balcony. <laughs> People are unrefined. Jacques shot me a look, clearly not as amused by my little joke as I was. The truth of the matter is, my disdain for sitting in the balcony had less to do with refinement and more to do with my irrational fear of heights. <laughs> Nightmarish visions of a violent 10.0 earthquake striking San Francisco <laughs> and me plummeting four stories to my death flashed through my mind. After settling into our seats, I began paging through the show's program in a feeble effort to distract myself from these terrifying thoughts, as well as the dizzying sensation I felt every time I peered down at the stage and realized that the only thing separating me from it was a little brass railing and a whole lot of open air. I felt my armpits juice up as I located, my nearest, <laughs> as I located the nearest emergency exit. This is kind of scary, I said to Jacques. Just don't look down, he replied. How can I not look down when the stage is down? <laughs> Just then, the house lights dimmed and the orchestra erupted into the show's overture. Aside from my slight case of vertigo, everything was going just fine at first, until about five minutes into the play when my nostrils were suddenly assaulted not by a smell, but by a stench. A piercing, repugnant, unforgettable stench. It was like 50,000 eggs boiled in a homeless man's bathwater. Someone... Someone passed gas. It was the kind my friends and I would have called silent but violent when we were kids. Unheard, but certainly not unnoticed. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most offensive. It was a solid 8, maybe even a 9. Now, I'm pretty sure that most people would agree public flatulence is impolite, especially when you're someplace cultural like the theater. <laughs> the only place more impolite would be at a restaurant where people are eating, or maybe on an elevator where they can't escape. <laughs> of course, it's also impolite to take notice when another individual passes gas, a faux pas to the faux pas, if you will. So while my immediate instinct was to leap up from my seat and holler, who farted? <laughs> then dramatically cut my hand over my nose and mouth to cover the smell, I didn't. Instead, I quietly held my breath until the air had cleared. But just when I thought it was safe to breathe again, it happened a second time. <laughs> Another back-end blowout, only this one was even more rancid than the last. A definite 11, it smelled less <laughs> of hard-boiled eggs and more like a week-old piece of decomposing roadkill sizzling under the midsummer sun. Still, I exercised self-control by holding my breath and pretending not to notice, then surveyed the people around me to see if I could determine who the offender might be. <laughs> Was it the 40-year-old Asian woman sitting to my right? <laughs> or the older Pacific Heights couple a few seats down? Could it be one of the four identical-looking marina girls sitting in the row directly in front of me? Or the balding gentleman seated in the row directly in front of them? Of course, it was impossible to tell. That's part of what makes passing gas in public so offensive. <laughs> that it's an anonymous assault on innocent victims. <laughs> Now, by this point, it was a good 15 minutes or so into the play, and I hadn't the slightest idea what was happening on stage. <laughs> because I had been so distracted. <laughs> First by the vertigo, then by the wind and laden. <laughs> and then, just as I was starting to get back into the performance, it happened a third time. <laughs> and 
this one was almost palpable. I felt the temperature around me rise. The air, the air felt thicker. I almost tasted it. Oh my God, I thought. I'm not sure how much more of this I can take. The group of identical-looking marina girls in front of me all turned and whispered to one another, then covered their noses. Just then, Jacques leaned over and whispered, Is that you? <laughs> what? <laughs> me? I whispered back, offended that he would assume so, but also slightly horrified. We'd only been dating for three and a half months after all, and had yet to reach that stage in our relationship where we were comfortable discussing our bodily functions together, let alone performing them in front of one another. <laughs> I can't believe you think I'd... Shh! A woman shushed from a few seats down. I felt my cheeks blush red with embarrassment as I sunk down in my chair, silently wishing death upon whoever kept breaking wind. <laughs> now, in addition to ruining my theater-going experience, they were imposing upon my relationship, forcing my new boyfriend and I to confront a reality about one another that neither of us were ready to address. The aerial assaults continued all through Act One, at about five minute intervals. At some point, I finally threw politeness to the wind, no pun intended, and pulled my shirt over my nose using it as an impromptu surgical mask to shield myself from the smell. And I wasn't the only one. Pretty much everyone within a 10-foot radius was doing it, too. By the time intermission rolled around, I felt as though the vapors had been absorbed into my body through the pores of my face. I couldn't wait to get outside for a little fresh air. I feel like I just spent the past hour and a half in a gas chamber waiting to die, I said to Jacques outside in the lobby. Do you even know what's happening in this play? Jacques hadn't been able to focus either. I spent the whole time trying not to suffocate. <laughs> this is exactly why I don't sit in the balcony. <laughs> the lobby lights flickered and we reluctantly made our way back into the theater. At this point, I should note that the four identical looking marina girls who'd previously been sitting in front of me had left, as had the balding gentleman a few rows up. Apparently, they were all so offended by the stale winds of Act One that they weren't willing to stick around and smell what Act Two might have in store. The house lights went down, the stage lights came up, and not one minute into Act Two, the offender struck again. And then again, and then again, and then again. A little over an hour later, the moment the curtain finally dropped, everyone around me leapt up from their seats and bolted for the exit. Let's go, I said, grabbing Jacques by the wrist. I need a neti pot, a hot shower, and, and a full-body chemical peel after that. My God! It amazes me how many people out there can be so discourteous to others without feeling any sort of remorse or embarrassment for their actions. How a person can go to the theater and pass gas for three hours straight, <laughs> upsetting all the other patrons around them, and not think twice about it is beyond me. When I shared this story with a few friends, many of them told me about similar experiences they had had with strangers performing private acts in public. My friend Jen, for instance, recalled a time when she saw a woman flossing her teeth on a crowded New York subway. My friend Mike said he once witnessed a man clipping his nails on a flight to Chicago. What makes the story even more unsettling is that the man was seated in first class, and the nails he was clipping were his toenails. <laughs> <laughs> then there's my friend Finn, who recently sat near a man who repeatedly blew his nose into his napkin at Fleur de Lis, the five-star French restaurant in Knob Hill. But the story that takes the cake is when my friend Amanda saw a woman who she claims didn't appear to look homeless or otherwise deranged, defecating on the sidewalk outside of her apartment in Soma. She didn't even sneak into an alley, Amanda said. She just did it right there, on the sidewalk, in broad daylight, in front of my living room window. What's even worse is we made eye contact while she was doing it. <laughs> then what did you do, I asked, appalled. What do you think I did? Amanda replied, I shut the blinds, called my landlord, put in my 30-day notice, and moved. <laughs> it's hard not to wonder what's going through people's minds when they do things like this. 
Are they aware of the fact that there are others around them who may be offended by their actions, or don't they care? Do they somehow get off on it, or are they just completely oblivious to the social graces? I think a lot of it has to do with accountability, or rather, the lack of accountability that often comes with living in a city where everyone is more or less anonymous, or dare I say, invisible. It's easy to feel invisible when you're just one out of a million, but it's important to remember that you're not. It's also important to remember that others aren't either. Now, I would like to conclude this essay with a brief message to whoever kept breaking wind at the theater that evening. <laughs> Gas sex relieves pressure, floating, and discomfort, which on people's feet. Relax, refocus, and get back on track. Gas sex, the trusted leader in gas relief. <laughs>